Good morning, everyone. It is May 17th, and it is a rainy Sunday morning in Northern Illinois, but we are glad that you have joined us this day for our worship service, and we are grateful to be able to bring to you our Hope Contemporary service this week. It's been a, been a little while since we've been able to, to do one of those, but now that we're back in the sanctuary, we're able to do that, and we especially thank Beth um, for coming up with the music and performing it as well. Before we jump into our first song, I do want to say thank you to all the ones who are, are helping out with this service this morning. We have our less than 10, and we are socially distanced and doing everything we're supposed to with that. Um, we are grateful that Kelly, Marsha, and Josh are working on the on the production of it. We've got Bruce and Sue who are who are doing the the um, the video of it. Julie is back at the PowerPoint, um, and we've got Janet being the liturgist, and of course Beth doing the music. So we thank all of them for being willing to take the time, the effort, and sharing their talents this morning. So without further ado, we will start in with our. Um, our music and our first song of worship today is Confidence. I'm not a warrior, too afraid to lose. I feel unqualified for what you're calling me to. But Lord, with your strength, I've got no excuse Cause broken people are exactly who you use So give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness Give me a heart like David, Lord be my defense So I can face my giants with confidence took a shepherd boy and made him a king so I'm gonna trust you and give you everything I'll be a conqueror cause you fight for me I'll be a champion claiming your victory so give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den give me hope like Moses in the wilderness Give me a heart like David Lord be my defense So I can face my giants with confidence I'm gonna sing and shout and shake the walls Won't stop until I see them fall Gonna stand up, step out when you call Jesus, Jesus I'm gonna sing and shout and shake the walls Won't stop until I see them fall Gonna stand up, step out when you call Jesus, yeah Give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness Give me a heart like David, Lord be my defense So I can face my giants with confidence Give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness Give me a heart like David, Lord be my defense 
defense So I can face my giants with confidence I'll face my giants with confidence Amen. What a wonderful message that song has. We will join in with some uh, announcements from the church. So we are blessed to be able to have um, Beth joining us with music today. But, and we will also be having a recording of Alcanus um, playing a more, more traditional or more classical piece of music later on in the service. Um, but we would love to have more people helping out with the music in our services, be it the more contemporary or the more traditional. So if you're interested in helping out either on Sunday morning or recording something for it, please contact Karen Newby or myself if you would like to offer music to, to the Lord through your church. We could also use help on Sunday mornings now that we're back in the sanctuary. Um, we can use help with people being liturgists, running PowerPoint, helping with the audiovisual, and leading the singing. So if you're interested, please contact me either by phone or by email, and we'll get you scheduled in. We know that um, the Princeton High School students are now done for the year, and it's of course been such a very interesting and difficult year for them and our thoughts and prayers are certainly with the graduating class of 2020 um, as they can't do things as as all the other ones have basically in the past but we would certainly like to recognize you so please um, if you haven't sent in information for your family or even for yourself um, let us know and we will include them in our graduation recognition coming up in just a few weeks the June newsletter articles are due on Friday, May 22nd, so please send them in by email to Marcia in the church office. A wonderful team of ladies has been calling our church family members who are not connected by way of email a couple of times during the week, actually, to read the devotions that we send out, give announcements, or share in any prayer concerns. Um, if you know of someone who is not being called, um, please contact me and we will get you signed up then. I also want to lift up that the trustees have a meeting tomorrow night, Monday night, at 6.30 p.m. by Zoom. I sent out that link um, earlier today, so please um, look for that in your email, and we will have our, our uh, May meeting tomorrow night. And lastly, uh, things will be done a little different in terms of worship um, this next Sunday on May 24th. Um, we will have a worship service for you available at 8 o'clock, but it, like I said, it'll just be a little different because for the most part, it won't be us here in Princeton. Our bishop asks that every pastor have a three-day Sabbath during the month of May because of all the interesting things that we've been having to learn and grow and be challenged with. And so we chose to do that on Memorial Day weekend, and we also decided to let Marsha and Kelly have that time off because they've been working a couple hours here and there as well. Haha, -ha, they've been working their tails off as well. So we are going to have off from Thursday through Memorial Day Monday. So the cabinet of the Northern Illinois Conference, which includes Pastor Brian Gilbert, who was your pastor before me, um, who is now a district superintendent, he will be taking part in the worship service that will be available next Sunday at 8 o'clock. Just know that we will make sure joys and concerns are in there as well, and um, the prelude and postlude music will be patriotic music as done by Charlie G. Beck as well. So there will be something different to look forward to next week. At this time, I think that is all of the announcements. Now I'm going to invite Janet Becker to lead us in our focusing prayer for this morning's service. Please, pr please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, thankful to be together as the body of Christ. Though we are not all in this physical space together, we are still one in Christ. And there is comfort in knowing we are together in spirit. We humbly come to you knowing that we are not worthy of your love, but thankful for the assurance that we are indeed your precious children. Help us on this day to truly worship you in every word, action, and deed. Open our hearts and minds to what you have for us today. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Janet. Our next song is entitled Broken Vessels. Oh. 
All these pieces broken and scattered In mercy gathered, mended and whole Empty-handed but not forsaken I've been set free, I've been set free Amazing grace, how sweet the sound That saved a wretch like me Oh, 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 oh I once was lost, but now I'm found Was blind, but now I see Oh, I can see you now Oh, I can see the love of down, raising up the broken to life. You take our failure, you take our weakness, you set your treasure in jars of clay so take this heart Lord I'll be your vessel the world to see your life in me amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me oh, I once was lost I can see you now Oh, I can see the love in your eyes Laying yourself down Raising up the broken to Thank you very much, Beth. And now we will have our children's message for today. So, Rufus, it's good to see you back in church. Are you glad you're back in church most of the time now? He said yes. He said yes. He doesn't like it at my house very much, so there's not enough band in us, right? Right. Okay. So, you are sitting with a new friend today, aren't you? He said it's not that much of a friend. It's just more comfortable to sit than on the, on, the, on, the, on the wood. So, okay, well, that's fine. Do you know this one's name, who this is? Yes, it's Zebra. You're right. He's a zebra. Okay. And I, Zebra lives at the ha my house, right? Yes. Okay. So, do you, I really like zebras. You know that. I've got zebras all over the place at my house, at, in my office. But do you think I worship a zebra like this, a zebra statue? Rufus says, no, but if it was a big statue of a banana, he might be willing to do that. Well, I will tell you something, Rufus. I don't think you should do that either. 
I do not worship zebras. I really like them, but I don't think you should worship anything like that. Rufus, do you know what to worship something actually means? Well, I will tell you. To worship something means to show reverence and adoration for something that you believe is po more powerful or bigger than you. So do you think that a zebra or a banana is bigger than I am? Sometimes, maybe. You're right. But should I honor it simply because it's bigger than me? No, you're right. I may love zebras. I may love pizza. I even may love my mother. But I'm not going to worship any of them. Okay? Why not? Because none of them are God. While I certainly wanted to show love to my mom this last week because of Mother's Day, there's only one being in this world who can help and guide me in every situation. And that isn't even my mom, Rufus. That is God. God is most powerful. God has unconditional love for me. And God is the one who follows me everywhere I go. That's why he's the one that I know I should worship. Have you ever heard of other people making an idol or like a statue to worship? That's okay. Let me tell you, back in Old Testament times, before Jesus ever came along, God's people actually made a calf or a little cow out of gold that they melted all their jewelry down into. Do you think that makes a lot of sense to worship something that you created? No, it doesn't make much sense, does it? I, why would you praise something that you yourself made? So I don't know what they were really thinking back then. But do you think, so then, do, does it make any sense that I would worship this zebra, which you can knock on it and it doesn't do anything? No, you're right. It isn't very powerful, is it? So Rufus, I think you're smart to say that you should not worship anything besides God. While zebras and bananas are awesome, and we can love them a lot, they aren't even close to being as powerful or as loving as our God. So Rufus, let's save our worship for God and God alone, okay? Sounds good. Thanks so much, Rufus, for joining us, and thank you kids very much for being able to help us um, remember what we should be worshiping in this life. And at this time, we are going to be watching and listening to a video by Alkanis. He um, played some classical music for us. I believe, well, it's, uh, I think it's up on the screen already. It's Bach's Prelude in C. So let's listen to Al perform this beautiful piece of music. This is Johann Sebastian Bach's Prelude in C.
Thank you very much, Al. You did a wonderful job, and it's always wonderful to have our youth be able to share their gifts and talents with the church. We will now share in our joys and our concerns for this week, and I have to say that we didn't have an awful lot come in this week, and my hope is that that is a good thing, that there's not too, too many people having lots of, lots of difficulties this week, but I will certainly share those that did come in. We have asked continued prayers for Agnes Dunn. She went to the doctor um, out in Iowa City a good while ago and is still awaiting her test results. She has met with some of the other, uh, with some other doctors and all, but still hasn't gotten the official test results yet. So Agnes, we continue to pray with and for you. Joanne Creason's granddaughter, Jaden, has had a very, very difficult last um, month or so. She lost her father, and then her mother had COVID-19, and then she, she herself, Jaden, was bitten by a spider on her leg and had a very severe reaction to it. So we ask continued prayers for Jaden as she goes through this very, very difficult time. We also are asking people who are having surgery coming up this week um, that we keep them in our prayers as well as those who have checkups with their doctor in terms of um, how things can be um, attended to here in the near future. I also ask prayers for those who are hurting for loved ones. Sometimes we, we get so so concentrated on praying for people who, who have the difficulties that we forget that there are people who love them who are going through those same emotions even if they are not faced with the exact um, affliction. So we pray for all those who are dealing with um, difficulties in their family or with friends. Um, may they find strength and comfort in you, Lord, at this time too. And I would also like to say as a joy, we lift up those um, who have been celebrating birthdays, especially this past week. We had several of our youth. Um, I believe it's Abby, Davis, Abby Davis's 18th birthday today. Philip Goodale had a birthday this week. And my own Aunt Avalon had her 80th birthday on, on Friday. And I just think it's so neat, the, the very innovative ways that people are choosing and coming up with to celebrate these these wonderful occasions so may we continue to recognize the many many blessings that are in our lives and celebrate them well while leaning upon god to get us through this difficult time at this time then i would ask us to bow our heads for the pastoral prayer and then at the end of it we will share in our lord's prayer together out of the swirling chaos that so often becomes our lives, O Lord, we cry to you. We pray not just for ourselves, but for all the people whose days seem empty of your blessings right now. For those who have experienced the loss of financial stability, whose resources are nearing an end, who wonder how bills will be paid and how stomachs will be filled, we ask your blessing and mercy. For those families who have known great tragedy, for all who are grieving the death of loved ones, whose mourning has not yet been turned into dancing, Lord, in your mercy, do hear our prayers. And we pray also this day for those who wrestle with chronic or life-threatening illness, whose physical or emotional pain doesn't seem to end, whose mercy is often undertaken alone, and those who grow nearer to death with heavy hearts. Lord, we certainly ask your attention to be upon all of them. And for all the other concerns that are on our hearts, we ask you to attend to them. Allow us to feel your blessing and to know that you are truly with us in bad times and good. Do help us to always thank you for the blessings in our lives and never, ever take them for granted. Hear now the prayer that your Son, our Savior, asked us to pray with him and for you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. And now it's my pleasure to invite Janet back to read for us the first of our scripture readings for this day. The reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 22 to 31. A little background, Paul was brought before a court, and that name was Arapagus. And he wasn't being formally charged, but he was only being asked to defend his teachings at this time. Hear the reading. Then Paul stood in front of the Arapagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship. I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed the day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. The word of God for the people of God. Very much for for that reading, and now we will have our gospel reading for today. Um, these are the words of Jesus from the Gospel of John, and you're welcome to stand if you would like um, on your feet or raise up in heart for what Jesus has said. John chapter fourteen verses fifteen through twenty one. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and He will give another give you another Advocate. To be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And if you are standing, you may be seated at this time. It is always interesting to track the attendance pattern when I head to a new church. I use that as one measure of how well I'm being accepted here. Thankfully, there has not been any church yet that is simply tanked in terms of attendance right after I got there. For the first six months that I was here at Princeton First, worship attendance has pretty, pretty much continued as average compared to the last few years. I consider that just fine especially with the decline in overall church attendance in America. To have things stay relatively stable is good at this point. Of course, what's been even more interesting is what's happened to worship attendance when we haven't been in the church building for the last two months. Now, I know we have to take internet numbers with a grain of salt, but with Facebook engagements and YouTube views, 
we've been averaging 600 worshipers with us the last eight Sundays. And at our highest point, the Youth Sunday, which of course I had barely anything to do with, we had over 1,400 views. I'm not sure if that's a correlation there or not. But no matter what, it's a definite change from our typical 170 average. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to actually record those big numbers in the official statistics since everyone didn't actually come in the church building. But that boost in people witnessing our ministry is one of the positive outcomes that has happened in the midst of all this coronavirus hardship. We all know, though, that increasing worship attendance is not typical in today's world. For many decades now, the number of people attending church in America has been on the decline, especially since the year 2000. Finding churches of any denomination that are increasing in attendance tends to be rare. I think there are many factors for this. We live in a time that doesn't trust any organized establishment very much. Families are just so busy now with sports, dance, music, and everything else scheduled, even on Sundays. Many families just aren't teaching much about God in their own homes as well. I've been told that the Christian faith is always one generation away from extinction, which in theory is true. If we don't keep teaching our children about God, Jesus, and the importance of church, eventually Christianity as a practiced faith, will disappear. Now that I don't think will happen anytime soon, but it's understood now that fewer adults take the time to tend to their children's spirituality at home. So when the church is not frequented, as much due to people's busyness, God and Jesus just aren't nearly as well known. But that does not mean people aren't being religious. Now, you might contest that statement. Pastor Ryan, you just said fewer people are attending church and learning about God. How can you say people are still religious? I say that in terms of the dictionary definitions of the word religious. Here are two of them. First, the belief in and worship of a superhuman controlling power, especially a god or gods. Here's the second. Religion is a pursuit or interest to which someone ascribes supreme importance. Neither definition requires a person to practice dedication to an omnipotent, unseen being who is loving. Religion means that you are dedicated to something that is bigger than you. And it is my personal belief that pretty much anything can be made into a little g God. It is whatever you choose to worship, that you spend the majority of your time on, that you make the biggest priority in life. That means video games, family, work, other people, music, or even the church can become a little G God in your life rather than the actual one true big G God. The way I see this play out most nowadays is with sports. People spend so much time, energy, and money on sports, either playing or following them, that they've, in essence, changed from devotion to God, who can make their life better, to people playing a ball game, who oftentimes win less than half the time they play, let alone having the whole world in their hands. Yet, instead of just enjoying sports for the entertainment and physical exercise value they definitely have, What controls their life is how well a game is played. But most people tend not to realize how much devotion they've pledged to something that is controlling their life. Did you know that the percentage of nuns, N-O-N-E-S, meaning those in America who claim no religion whatsoever, is now the largest it's ever been since polling began on a large scale. Nuns now stand at 23% of the U.S. population, statistically tied with the largest individual Christian group, Roman Catholicism. So that means approximately one quarter of our country does not claim any religion at all. They don't believe they are following any kind of higher power. 
Interestingly, that does not mean they don't believe in God. Many call themselves spiritual, just not religious. I've heard this over and over when I do weddings and sometimes even at funerals. People tell me they believe in God and they think Jesus was a great guy, but they don't want to be in a church unless it's for their wedding or when grandma or grandpa passes. But I would say that they just might yet be religious, just not in the way grandma or grandpa was. We all will hold certain things above others in this life. The difficulty is recognizing when things come to a point of religious devotion and worshiping that as a god and possibly giving it way too much power when the creator, redeemer, and sustainer asks that only God be worshipped. Now, to be fair, this devoutness to something other than God is nothing new. It's talked about in the Bible. In the story from Acts today that Janet read, Paul is preaching in Greece, claiming to know an unknowable God that the Greeks didn't want to offend. I'm not sure how much you remember from childhood stories about Greek mythology, but it was a passion of mine when I was young. The Greeks believed in many, many gods and goddesses, including ones that were in charge of love, war, the home, the sea, the underworld. If you wanted something in particular, you prayed to that specific God. Or you just prayed in general because you, and sacrificed so that you didn't anger them with whatever you said or did. In the city of Athens, besides there being a council called the Areopagus, there was also a place or a hill called the Areopagus. It's at near the center of the city where the courts and tribunals used to be held. It was also a place, besides where courts were happening, where it was a place where orators would just stand up and give oftentimes long-winded speeches, hoping to win converts to their way of thinking and possibly even give them money. It was here where the Apostle Paul stood up and he delivered one of his most famous speeches. When I visited Greece, I had the privilege of standing right where tradition says Paul stood, and I delivered a few words, not nearly a whole sermon. It was inspiring to be in the same place Paul was when he delivered a speech that converted some of his Greek listeners, including ones who would help in his ministry for years to come. You see, the Greeks loved to hear new ideas. So Paul claiming to know the previously unknown God was tantalizing to them. Remember, Paul felt called to bring the message of Jesus to non-Jews, people who had never heard of Yahweh or the Messiah before. To claim he knew this unknown God, that there was a shrine set up somewhere around in this area, that other people had no idea who it was, but they were praying to it to make sure they didn't um, make anybody mad. That he knew this God was pretty gutsy. And I imagine that's why Paul gained some new followers for Christ after that sermon. In the ancient world of religion done in the same way for hundreds and hundreds of years, something like this shook up the establishment. It got people excited about faith again. Back in ancient Greece, there was also a wide variety in how people worshipped. In Athens, where Paul delivers this speech, you had Jews who would have been the first audience he had. He would have gone to them first. Then he branched out to people who were the typical religious folk, the ones who feared the gods and would make proper sacrifices to make sure they weren't angry and that the gods were pleased. Then you had a group called the Epicureans. They tended to be the upper class who had money. They believed in the ancient gods, but they didn't think that they were very involved in regular human life. And when they were, they just wanted people to be happy. The Epicureans spent their time pursuing pleasure and happiness. They did their very best to avoid pain. To me, it sounds like there's probably a few descendants of the Epicureans around today. 
Then there was another group called the Stoics. They were pretty much the opposite. They did not believe pleasure was good at all. They avoided any kind of pleasure, and they didn't want much to do with the gods either. They were believed in, but the old traditions were always questioned and usually not followed. So there were many types of belief back then as well. How did Paul cut through all that and get people to listen? Here's what Paul did that I think can make a difference today as well. First, he did not condemn the people who didn't believe or act just like him. In fact, he in essence applauds them. He tells them he appreciates how religious they are. The Athenians are devoted people, wanting to honor and worship something. Then Paul proceeds to state that what he believes in is even bigger and better than what they're trusting in. He brilliantly starts where the people are at then pushes them to acknowledge something they know about but have probably forgotten, that there is this unknown God. Then he makes the case that what he knows about this God should convince them he's the best one. Paul doesn't condemn others because they aren't exactly like him. He shrewdly shows them why his way is the better way. In so many realms these days, including religion, we just keep screaming at each other, I'm right, you're wrong. I have to believe that if we calmly and rationally have conversations where we lay out our case for why we believe as we do, we'll be much more likely to help others understand our beliefs. Very few people I know enjoy being yelled at or told they're wrong. There are more civil ways to go about persuading others to see a better way. Paul shows that it can be done by using proof and personal testimony to build the case. Now that doesn't mean everyone's going to be convinced. It didn't work that way for Paul. But it was effective for him. And it likely would be today as well. Secondly, in order to win over people to God's point of view, you have to provide what they're looking for. There's just so much that distracts people these days. Things that promise fun, pleasure, meaning, longevity, instant gratification, fame. While I know we expect to be entertained with pretty much everything we do in today's world, the truth is that just won't happen. There are some tasks that we do that aren't enjoyable. Sometimes work is like that. Sometimes family is a chore. At times, life is just plain tough. But if you're concentrating on your faith, that is something that can positively impact you for a lifetime, not just for a moment. Sometimes these activities that we spend so much time on aren't really the life changers we expect. They're more time fillers than anything else. So what we need to do is help people understand that working on their relationship with God is worth it for the long haul. If they do, they invite the Lord to be an active part of their life, and one can only imagine how God will make things work for the positive when he's invited in. Back in Greece, the Athenians evidently hadn't found what they were looking for in all their pleasure-seeking. They were willing to listen to what Paul had to say because they still hadn't found what they were looking for. I have to believe that's the case for a lot of people yet today. I still find it amazing that anywhere from 500 to 1,500 people are watching some part of our worship service each week. While I know that the vast majority of those viewers are our own parishioners, I know that these videos are being shared and circulated. And you just never know when someone who is searching for a stronger connection with God will be sent to or simply stumble upon a worship video and be touched by the music, the prayers, maybe even the sermon. When a person's heart is open to something new, it's amazing how God can fill it. And one never knows when just one service, one prayer, even one word that we put out there 
could be what someone is searching for. That goes for internet services. That goes for someone coming to the church building for worship or a meal. That goes when individuals choose to spread love and joy instead of hate and division. May our church be a well from which God's life-giving water flows in the many ways that it can reach people. Did you know that people of faith are usually better citizens than those who are non-religious? A study made about 10 years ago found these results. Religious people are three to four times more likely to be involved in their community. They are more apt than non-religious Americans to work on community projects, belong to voluntary associations, attend public meetings, vote in local elections, attend protest demonstrations and political rallies, and donate time and money to causes, including secular ones. In other words, people who believe in God and practice it tend to be more involved in the community in general attempting to make life better for all. But the same study found that younger people are vastly more secular than previous generations. To me, that doesn't bode well for us or for them. To grow up without faith, without the support system of a faith family, or even just the concept that there is something more out there, without those things, it's sad for this whole world. And just because people are religious and following sports, work, or hobbies doesn't mean that the world is being improved because of that. My hope is that as life goes on, people will find that if they don't have God in their life, they are truly missing something. That there's a God-shaped hole that they've been trying to fill with everything else that just doesn't cut it. It doesn't complete them. And whether it's someone standing on the top of a hill ready to preach or an internet service ready for them to click on, I hope there is a word of hope from our God ready for them that just might turn their lives around. Let us be willing to share the good news of Jesus in a way that gets people interested and invites them to fill that hole in their heart. We are all going to be religious about something. I pray that we'll be led to the faith that provides what we truly need. Amen. And at this time, we are going to have the prayer over the offering. As always, we are very grateful for the monetary funds that have come in um, this past week. Um, we are able to be able to meet our needs in terms of payroll and keeping the building going and all those mission things throughout our community and world that we have uh, have agreed to accomplish because of your dedication in sending in um, these financial contributions. So please remember to keep doing that through dropping them off at the church, mailing them through PayPal, through your bank. We certainly appreciate um, and applaud your effort in doing that. So if you will please bow your heads with me for our offering prayer this week. We give, Lord, so others may live. And we give to praise you for life and love. And Lord, we give to share with the world the presence and the promise of the God who remains unknown to them at this point. May these blessings of your mercy give hope and sustenance to your children near and far. Amen. And now we will share in singing our closing song for our worship service today. It's one of my favorite contemporary songs, and all the people said, Amen. <laughs> You're not the only, we are all the same In need of mercy to be forgiven and be free It's all you got to lean on, but thank God it's all you need And all the people said amen Whoa, And all the people said amen Give thanks 
thanks to the Lord for his love never ends. And all the people said amen. If you're rich or poor, well, it don't matter. Weak or strong, you know, love is what we're after. We're all broken, but we're all in this together. God knows we stumble and fall. And he so loved the world, he sent his son to save us all. And all the people said amen. Whoa, and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for his love never ends. And all the people said amen. Blessed are the power in spirit who are torn apart. Blessed are the persecuted and the pure in heart. Blessed are the people hungry for another start. For theirs is the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And all the people said amen. Whoa, and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord for his love never ends. And all the people said amen. And all the people said amen. Oh, and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord for his love never ends. And all the people said amen. And all the people said amen. Amen. And a big thanks today to Beth for providing the music. I know um, myself, it is not easy to play and sing at the same time, but you did a great job, Beth. So thank you very much for blessing us with that. And again, thank you to everybody who was here making the sanctuary um, service work. We, there's a lot of time and effort that's put into it and so much dedication. So we are certainly appreciative of that for each person who here to do that. And thank you out there to those who are, are listening and hoping hopefully being blessed because of it. If you will please join me in our unison blessing, which will be found on your screen. We go into the days ahead with strength in the Spirit and confidence in Christ. May peace be within and among us. Amen. Go in the peace, love, and joy of our Lord this day and always, and may all the people say, Amen.